In 22 years, I've never allowed this to happen to a client of mine. Never has a client ever been photographed getting makeup on. The press tried to trash me, and I tore them apart. They hate to admit that they're in the same business I am, you know. They, <laughs> it, it just drives them crazy. This is a B-roll camera. Takes all behind-the-scenes stuff. The television is best is a marvelous, marvelous medium. What we have is the power to persuade power to persuade people what's in their best interest. We are a society that television has brought us all closer together. We know more about each other, perhaps more than we want to know about each other. It's the closest thing to being in somebody's living room when you're, when you're on a television screen. You can get to an, uh, in th these audiences with short messages, and, and if you're good at it, um, begin this process of persuading them to the, the correctness of your client. There really is not a difference in the strategy for selling the president of the United States, selling a, an automobile, selling a, a, a so clearly a great favor in the campaign was that we just didn't handle communications, and especially communications for television. Well, the voters, uh, the journalists, uh, and the politicians are bringing out the worst in each other. The idiocy of our system is the whole thing's done in these little 30-second snippets. Let's try to make television not an enemy of reason dialogue in political campaigns, but let's try to make it an ally. This is serious business, this democracy. There is a certain amount of excitement in the battle. There's going to be some contact to it. It's going to be black and blue. Politics has been described as war without bullets. When they asked me to work on uh, Richard Nixon's campaign, I did some research on Nixon, and I found out that he liked Theodore Roosevelt. One of the most famous things that Theodore Roosevelt had ever written was, uh, it, is, it is not the critic who counts, but the man who is actually in the arena, the man whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. Whatever you thought of Richard Nixon, he had been through many of the political wars throughout his career. I don't believe that I ought to quit, because I am not a quitter. But as I leave you, uh, I want you to know just think how much you're going to be missing. You don't have Nixon to kick around anymore. And it was my concept of presenting a man Richard Nixon. Uh, in an arena that would create a certain amount of theater, a certain amount of drama, that while you might not love Richard Nixon and you might not think him warm and fuzzy, you would respect the fact that he was tough enough to have lived through 30 years of political life in America. Now, how are you going to combat this situation? How are you going to work it out so that Americans are Americans and not black and white? I believe that it's vitally essential that whoever is the next president of the United States be able to unite this country. And so the concept of the man in the arena was to create the staging for the 68 campaign, that of a man who had experience and was tough. Yeah, we were there on the other side. That was a, a remarkable campaign. It was the first campaign I worked in. Voters saw the difference between those two campaigns and reacted to the openness of the Humphrey campaign. I'd like to ask you why you did not speak out against the war earlier in your campaign. Well, I've never been for war. I sort of felt, however, that in light of the commitment that our country had made... He took questions from real people on the night before the election. Whereas on the, uh, on the opposite channel that Ailes was running, it was very tightly controlled. Everything was rehearsed in advance. Our belief was uh, that voters are very smart. I think their belief was that voters are not this smart and, and, and can be fooled. never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. I had no part in the 1972 campaign and had not been involved, but because people associated me with Nixon from 68, it nearly shut off my political business, and I was sort of untouchable for a few years. We don't trust our leaders anymore as a result of Vietnam and Watergate, and we, we don't trust uh, our future. Ronald Reagan, uniquely over the last 20 or 25 years, got beyond that, and there was a period of time in the early 80s where we did beat our breasts as a culture and say, hey, we, we, we're still number one. It's morning again in America. Today, more men and women will go to work than ever before in our country's history. With interest rates and inflation down, more people are buying new homes, and our new families can have confidence in the future. 
America today is prouder and stronger and better. Why would we want to return to where we were less than four short years ago? What was put together on the Tuesday team was a group of um, most famous people in, in American advertising. They thought that there were people in the product advertising arena who were capable of bringing a greater ability to uh, make things larger than life. His strategy for that campaign was to basically chloroform the American people. And one of the best ways to do that is to produce advertising that has this kind of chloroform effect, this warm, fuzzy, wonderful, you love America, don't think about anything, you know, try to wipe thoughts out of your mind, just think images, isn't he a wonderful man, and then time to vote. There wasn't any need to chloroform anyone. There was a need to, to I guess, report on the very happy events that had been going on for the last two or three years and that had, uh, had rescued the, uh, the country uh, from the suicide of Jimmy Carter. They wanted pretty ads that showed how well Reagan had done in the last few years, and that was a good, good idea. And some of the advertising people were able to adapt very well. But when, when the race is close and tight, you then begin to get into a serious dialogue. And when you do that, you, you need people who understand how voters work, not how toothpaste comes off the shelf. The advertising that was done for President Reagan will probably or has probably changed the way political advertising will be done forever. If you go back and look at the, at the product advertising that was done, there was a resurgence of sort of red, white, and blue patriotic product ads. There's a lot of difference between selling people and selling and ideas as opposed to products. Products sit on a shelf, people hold press conferences. Uh, they're liable to screw up in a press conference. So for a lot of reasons, I think you, you have uh, devised a much more sophisticated rules of persuasion that go into the political uh, process that just don't apply in product advertising. In an, in an election, there's so many elements at work, a lot of which has to do with selling soap. It's, it's selling something. It's selling a feeling, a mood, a person, an idea. Then the tools that one uses, which can be a brass band going down Main Street with some full sign behind it and some smiling person kissing babies, or it's a, it's a commercial that somebody produces that, that, that reflects what they think either the voters want or what the voters think of the candidate. The only difference being, whereas in cigarettes or in soap or in automobiles, you're asking, continually asking people to go out and buy the product. We're only asking them to buy the product once. So therefore, in a political campaign, you're, you're, you're looking for a very quick turnaround of opinion or solidification of opinion. Whereas in product advertising, you're often just beginning a long process that may change as time goes on, as the product changes, as tastes change, as people change. There's something else that's interesting that sort of foreshadowed the politics of 1988, which was nastier which was product advertising got a little nastier. How fast is the new Isuzu Impulse Turbo? How does 950 miles per hour sound? The Joe Isuzu commercial came on, and there were a couple of other commercials that came on in around 86 and 87 that were parodies of ads. Well, what's going on here? It's letting the viewer in on the dirty little secret that the viewer has known all along. We all sort of lie to you, and, and so let's, you know, let's sell a product off of this. The Impulse Turbo. Faster than a speeding... Well, you know. So, so that was the dawn of a, of a more cynical era, and I think uh, four or five years later, we're still in that more cynical era. The most memorable uh, slogan of 1988 was George Bush saying, Read my lips. Said it day in and day out. Uh, the Washington Post took a poll two days after the campaign. Seven out of ten Americans said no, we didn't believe it. So we have voters who have been conditioned to expect to be pandered to. It sends a message back to the politicians. If if you reward panderers, how can you have a you know how can you have a meaningful dialogue? I believe I understand people, and and what motivates them and 
my job is to make them feel pretty much at ease in a media situation. In this day and age, a candidate who is serious about running for an important political office had better have people around them who understand the uh, technique and the technology of campaigning via television. Just as you don't walk in here with a pad of a, a, a paper and a pencil and do this television interview with just those simple tools of a reporter, what you have instead is, you know, you filled my office full of junk. I mean, if, if, if this camera that's been, you know, moving around the room could look around, you know, you'd find, a, you know, an umbrella here and a light on it and, a, you know, there's a light back here and there's a card here so that the shadow doesn't fall in a certain way and there's another card there that prevents the light from shining into the lens of the camera. You know, the place is, the place is loaded with equipment. Uh, if you walked in here with all this equipment and none of these people to, to do it, uh, you'd be at sea. You wouldn't know what to do. Uh, that's basically the analogy for a political campaign. I'm sitting here today on television with makeup on. I don't wear it on the street, but uh, because it helps under these lights, I wear it. Is that image making? Well, I don't know. I suppose somebody can say that. A lot of people have said to me that I was at my best in the last three or four weeks of the campaign. Uh, I had a makeup person with me for the first time in the campaign all the time. I think that candidates use media specialists and consultants and us uh, with tools, like the guy that drives the campaign truck or the sound man or the guy who makes the signs. I make a recommendation. If they follow it, great. If they don't, my job is to try to come up with another recommendation. The people who know how to run these cameras have now taken the place of bosses and they are, in a sense, electronic bosses. People want to have a sense that the person they're voting for is, is decent, is honorable, is, is reasonably friendly, and, and you've got a responsibility to try to persuade people that you are that kind of person. And if you begin to try to stage things, to try to kind of fake things up, um, it, it'll backfire on you. Each person is his or her own message, and you have to project that message. I don't know whether you have to go to acting school to, to be president of the United States. I hope not. If they're attractive, if they have something to say, they have a small group of camp followers, if they have access to money, they can become heavy players. The guys who spend more time uh, hunting for their blow dryer before the interview than looking up their notes uh, are dangerous. So I don't think that uh, it's a cosmetic thing. The ones that are the most successful in every case are the ones that know the most care the most and know why they're in politics. We take it as our journalistic mission to scrutinize uh, campaign speeches, to scrutinize press conferences if there's misstatements or whatnot. The most powerful forms of communication happen in these 30-second ads. My goodness, we have to scrutinize them too. And that's the job of the press, to make sure that we're, we're on our toes, that we're meeting high standards, that uh, we're not kidding the American public. Well, I have an orchestra pit theory of politics. The orchestra pit theory goes like this. You have two people on a stage. One guy says, I can solve all the problems in the Middle East. And the other guy stands up, and he's about to talk. He falls in the orchestra pit. Who do you think is going to be on the front page of the paper and lead the evening news that night? Obviously, the guy lying in the orchestra pit. Because I would hope that uh, if, the man, <laughs> if the man on the stage says something really important, that's the lead. And the guy who falls in the orchestra pit, we, we relegate to a small uh, picture somewhere inside. But uh, in the real world, uh, I'm not sure that's the way it works. Everything you do is so thoroughly scrutinized these days. They take on the major importance. I mean, Jerry Ford stumbling once or twice, I mean, it was kind of a metaphor for Ford's uh, uh, indecisiveness or something. It was crazy. I get up every morning and try to figure out how to make my candidate look good. They get up every morning and try to figure out how to humiliate him. The American public is wise to our ways, just as it's wise to the, to the ways of the candidates. They are very fair-minded. They have seen this game you know, again and again and again. In this business, uh, it is a little bit like a very serious electronic war game, at which you're sitting at one console, and somewhere across town, Roger is sitting at another console, and you're doing this kind of electronic war game back and forth in behalf of your clients. And when he's on the other console, um, uh, you know he's there. You design spots to control or to play to your base vote those people you are sure to get that you want to reinforce to get out to vote. And then you assume your opponents have a certain core vote you're not going to be able to touch, so you don't waste time talking to them. And the rest of the time you design commercials for that group in between that is the swing vote, the independent vote, the undecided vote, that may go to you and may go to the other side. The difference between the way political television uh, worked 
five or ten years ago, and the way it works now is opposition research. This is the candidate that we were running against. His man's name was George Brown. This is research information on him, and this is how Brown has voted. Since uh, re representation, you see he opposed Reagan and Bush most of the time, and he's voted with the Democrats almost all the time, 87% in 1989. We now know more about our opponents than they know about themselves. Most of it is just looking in public record. Newspapers, votes, laws, reports, it's all public. It's not like, you know, Sherlock Holmes. It's not, it's not like detective work. And it's not, you know, sleazy personal stuff. It's, it's mostly public record. First of all, you have to know what the opponent's done, what he said, how he voted, uh, everything about his background. We can see here that he received money from several labor unions, AFL-CIO, huge amounts of money. The accuracy is very important because if you don't have it right, it'll blow up. And I think we can use this against him because most of the people in this district of New Jersey are not uh, favorable to unions. In most cases in the campaign, as the campaign unfolds, you've predicted what your opponent's response is going to be, and you've already figured out how you're going to respond to that. Uh, it, it becomes very much like chess after a while. And often, if you're in a campaign, you'll make an, a, a, a particular move knowing what the opponent's response is going to be, because what you really want to do is deal with their response. Do you mind if I passively observe you? I do. And uh, what kind of deal could you make with me if I, you know, brought you along instead of hiring somebody local? Yeah, let's just do the three of them uh, once a piece, rather than once late. Take four, rolling. I want to get my hands on this state. To impact voters, often you have to exaggerate to get it through. We need a governor who will unleash government. Well, 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 President. People often don't know a whole lot about the candidate. I grew up here in Stearns County. I was blessed with 21 years in this place my parents established as home. So as their name identification goes up, a certain amount of qualitative information is also attached to them. We walked where we had to go. Every day we attended a 30-minute service in the parish chapel. Religion and moral values were an important part of our lives. Today, I find the same values everywhere in Minnesota. And that qualitative information is then used to make a judgment on election day. Oh, you Graham understands the special problems that our working mothers and their children face. He oh, had uh, uh, no recognition. Right Nobody knew who he was. What color is that that you have? I don't know. It showed his commitment. <laughs> but you also saw the human being that was inside, and you saw it in direct relation.